Um, all right, well, I see we have been joined by some participants, so I'll get this kicked off. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm the events coordinator at a Room of One's Own bookstore here in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and it is uh, my great joy to welcome uh, Jen Chaplin and Kate Gordon uh, with us tonight um, to talk about Jen's uh, National Book Award finalist, my autobiography of Carson McCullers. Um, I will drop a link to our store's uh, book page for this book if you like to click further, get some more info, but you should get um, all the info you'd ever want to know from this, uh, this event. Um, also, I uh, want to shout out Jen's uh, choice of wear tonight. Uh, it is Room of One's Own's uh, sweatshirt, originally designed by a local artist. Um, that's available through Bonfire. There's a link on the front page of our website uh, if anyone is interested. I believe there are still some for sale here. Uh, but uh, before we move forward, a couple quick introductions. First, um, Jen Chaplin lives in New Mexico. Uh, she calling in from uh, Santa Fe right now. Uh, her book, My Autobiography of Carson McCullers was a finalist for the 2020 National Book Award in Nonfiction. And her essay, Finders Keepers, won a 2017 Pushcart Prize. Uh, Kate Gordon, conversation partner, as a book reviewer and fiction writer, uh, reviews can be found on Autostraddle and The Rupture Magazine, as she has short stories that have been published in Prism International Magazine and Arcturus Magazine. Um, I want to thank them both for taking the time to join us this evening. It's very exciting to talk about a wonderful book. Um, after we wind down this evening, before I mute and go away, uh, there's another book event uh, happening here in Madison. I would urge everyone to drop in and check out from the Wisconsin Book Festival. Uh, Lady Hubbard and Dante Moniz, two uh, more wonderful authors are in conversation over there, uh, starting later on. So um, you shouldn't have to choose between one or the other. Um, but I gotta give them a plug because the Wisconsin Book Festival supports us and I do everything we can to support them back. Um, also, there is a YouTube link that I believe should be dropping in the chat uh, soon. Uh, it's a live stream from there as well, if you'd like to share that around. Um, and uh, that's all I got. I will turn it over now to Jen and Kate. Thanks again, everybody. I really hope you enjoy. And let's get... Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Hello, Jen. Hi, Kate, how are you? I'm so good, how are you? I'm good, one of my cats just started meowing, so that might they be just, part of it. They just wanna be part of, part of things, I don't blame them. He really wants, he just wants an audience. I also. love it. <laughs> so I think you chose a little section that you wanted to read from your fantastic book. This is my early copy, my autobiography of Carson McCullers. Yes, I have this. I have this oh, I know. It's so beautiful. I love the paperback too. Um, yeah. Um, and thank you so much. So Kate wrote like a really early review of this book that was extremely helpful for my self-confidence. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it publication. It was, it was really um, a thoughtful and fantastic review on, on Autostraddle. So kind of directed at the uh, queer community too, which was awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read a little bit um, just to get us going from uh, a little ways into the book. The book is in super short chapters, so this is um, just part of one of those where I talk a little bit about what I'm trying to do with the book in terms of biography, autobiography. So if you don't know anything about it and you're coming at it just from the title, um, maybe this will kind of help you think about it a little bit. Um, and the people I talk about in this are Carson McCullers, the writer from kind of the 1940s, um, that's when her best known books were published, um, a novelist from the South, and uh, I'm talking about a woman named Mary, Mary Mercer, who was her therapist late in her life, um, and among other things. Okay. And this chapter is called Qualifications. It is strange to apply the expectations of discovery and evidence to a person's life, let alone a person's love life. As I read and researched Carson, I learned that evidence itself is slippery and discoveries are never final. They shift as more voices, more sources are added to the mix. They shift according to the mood of the biographer or critic and according to my own mood and according to the mood of the weather on the day I'm reading. 
I didn't trust the discovery of Carson's relationship with Mary Mercer that I found in the therapy transcripts, in part because I suddenly didn't trust myself as a reader. If Carson was a lesbian, and if her relationships bore that out, wouldn't someone already have said so? Wouldn't it be known beyond rumors in the queer community? It was a real mindfuck, the back and forth between scanning indexes of heavily researched biographies that do not contain the words gay or lesbian or homosexual, and reading Carson's adamant descriptions of her own feelings and experiences. I also realized on some level that I was a com confused queer person looking to Carson as a ro role model. I looked to everyone I met as a role model. I was in my mid 20s. And so I must have been reading into her queerness, seeing what I wanted to see. I must have been a partisan of the gay agenda. Already I was suspicious of my own desire for quote, proof. In the introduction to his notes on her life, Carson's cousin Boots writes, I knew Carson too long and too well to be removed completely from the story of her life. But just what my role was and how important is not for me to decide. I am hardly qualified to write a biography of Carson McCullers. I am hardly qualified to write a biography of Carson McCullers. Who am I to her? I slid my arms up the sleeves of her long lime green wool coat. I folded her nightgowns. I labeled her socks. I made biscuits in the kitchen of her childhood home. And I walked in the park where she used to play by herself. I've read enough biographies to know in no uncertain terms that they are built of artifice and lies. I'm not a fiction writer and this is not a biography. Biographers usually seek to fill in gaps to add narrative to strict chronology, to render a person's life so that it reads like a 19th century novel. But Carson's is not an unwritten story. Rather, it is a story that has been written over, revised and adjusted to suit various people's needs. The more I read and researched, the more I began to question the versions of, of her life that exist and continue to circulate. I began to feel that someone, several someones, had put the jigsaw puzzle together all wrong to form a picture of Carson that didn't match the one I recognized. First, I had to take the puzzle apart and find all the faulty links. Then I began to reassemble it, a six-year process that took me from Austin, Texas, to Columbus, Georgia, to Saratoga Springs, New York, following leads and trying to fit the pieces together without knowing what the final version, my Carson, would look like. I'm still not sure how to know if I'm done. It is customary when writing a biography to talk to as many people who personally knew the subject as possible, but I instinctively avoided this. I didn't want to meet anyone. I didn't want to encounter another person who might try to put the pieces back their own way, who would tell me where the pieces go. I only wanted the pieces in her words and time. Carson's biographies, both the full length books and the life summaries that get rehashed whenever she's mentioned in print, take discrete forms. There's Carson the prodigy, the wunderkind, a shy small town girl who bumbles her way to literary stardom. There's Carson the drunk, sloppy and salty and probably exaggerating. And Carson the needy, ailing woman who is a burden to everyone who gets close to her. Carson the desperate, chasing down women and men and Carson the manipulator, seducing and using others. Carson called herself a bit of a holy terror and said she was writing her autobiography to explain how her early success and her chronic illness nearly destroyed her. None of these is my Carson. Yay. <laughs> I love, I love, I love, I love that section. Thanks. Um, and I mean, I, I love the book, obviously. You've read the reviews, you know how I feel about it. I was, I was looking through my copy today and it used to be just stacked with post-its of all the different themes and different things that you were doing. And now, I mean, there, there's, it's, there's pencil all over it. It was just, it was such an exciting read. It was something that I'd never seen done before. This, this combination of biography and memoir and also mystery because you're you know tracking this across the country and you refer to it as a crime scene so um I just had to say before we get started that I just really loved it so thank you so much for for spending six years on this 
on this feat, this incredible, incredible book. Thanks. Yeah. Is there, is there any other context you think folks need before we go forward? Um, I don't know. I mean, the only other context I would say is that because my own life does come into it, um, yeah. you know, kind of slowly but surely, um, at the time I was writing the book, I was in a graduate program in English, um, writing a dissertation on a totally different topic, living in Austin, Texas, and working at the Ransom Center, um, which is the archive where I ended up cataloging Carson McCullers' clothes. Um, so that's the nightgowns I refer to and the coats and things. Um, and so writing this book was kind of how I figured out a way out of academia and out of um, kind of that life and into a new life. It was also the time that I was coming out. Um, so yeah, kind of a lot of heady stuff going on in my life while I'm trying to un understand Carson's life. Cool. And so at, at some point you, you knew that this was going to be a book. Was it always going to be a combo of of her life and your life or did the memoir bit come in later as you started noticing similarities between the two of you? It's funny, I have like a note in one of my journals from like very early, I mean, I don't know, 2013, 2014, somewhere in there. Uh, and I just wrote like, I should write an autobiography of Carson McCullers. Um, and I think I had that thought because I was so frustrated when I realized that she had, she tried to write one, she tried to use her therapy transcripts to write one, she was dictating an autobiography at the end of her life, it was never finished. Um, and it was published in kind of its unfinished form. And so it really felt clear to me from the beginning, like I want the story that she would have told to be out in the world. Like, how can we recover that? How can we bring that out? Um, and then it was in the process of doing the research, you know, going to her house in Columbus, right? And finding these therapy transcripts at the archive there um, that also have kind of a lot of gaps in them, realizing how many gaps there are in the archive, how many missing pieces uh, are a part of this story, how many fragments, how many things were kind of written over, rewritten. Um, as I became aware of those moments of silence or kind of confusion, um, it was my own experience that I was able to kind of bring in as a way to translate that. Um, yeah. So even like the, the way the book starts is, is that I find these letters between Carson and a woman named Anne Marie in my job as an archivist, um, as an intern archivist. And, um, the letters are so obviously queer. They're so obviously <laughs> two women who are in love, like there's just yeah. no doubt about it. But then I go and read the biographies and they're kind of like, oh, maybe Carson had a crush on this woman. They were friends or Anne-Marie really didn't like her or all these other explanations that didn't feel right. But in my heart, I was like, I know these letters, written these letters, read these letters, very familiar with this dynamic, very right. familiar with the type that <laughs> Anne-Marie is, you know? So yeah. the memoir really started to come in as a way to say like, wait, I can speak to this as a queer person, even if we don't have a lot of direct language recording this in the past. Yeah, and I, I think that that was a, that to me resonated a lot is that there, there was this lack of language for Carson, right? Like the word lesbian wasn't, it was a word she'd heard for the first time, right? When she was a grown adult. So it was great to see the way you took what you knew and then Used, used your empathy and, and, and experience as a queer person to, to fill in the blanks of how Carson probably felt. And, that, and, and it, didn't feel, it didn't feel manufactured because the queerness over time, I mean, we kind of all know how it's gonna feel. Like at one point you mentioned longing and loneliness and how we all have that in common. And um, I just, I like the way that you, you fuse the two. It seemed, it seemed like it was, the plan from the beginning um, <laughs> because it was done so well. Um, so was, was there a point, cause it's, you were working on something else. So when did you know, like, oh, this is the book. Like this is when I put this aside and, and make my exit. Mm. Um, well, I had kind of a few formative experiences while I was in grad school. I, um, they mentioned in the introduction of, of essay I had written, I submitted it to a prize at UT and it didn't win, but it was a finalist. And this is like a crazy writing prize. If anyone ever finds themselves a student in any department at UT, you should submit to this because why the hell not? Um, because the winner wins $50,000 and all the finalists win $17,000. So I won kind of a chunk of money for me in grad school. That was like what I made in a year, you know, actually a little bit more than what I made in a year. 
And um, so like, it was like this moment of like, oh, maybe this writing thing could work. Like maybe that's the thing I could do. And then kind of like, okay, what can I do while I'm in grad school to sort of um, build on that, um, you know, that moment, like how can I, you know, develop my skills or develop my understanding of this field. And so I was able to go to the Tune House workshop using some of that prize money. Um, and I also was able to go to the Vermont Studio Center uh, writing and artist residency, which was both of those experiences were huge for me because I had been kind of surrounded by scholars and academics and grad students. And then suddenly I was imported into this world full of writers and artists, visual artists at Vermont Studio Center, um, who had a totally different way of understanding what their lives should look like and what work was and the value of work and the value of the work they were doing. Um, so like those moments were able, like ways that I could kind of shift the way I was thinking about what I was doing. And so meanwhile, I'm kind of pursuing this Carson McCullers thing and I'm talking about Carson McCullers like every time I'm out at drinks with someone and they're like, uh-huh. And so like, I, I'm trying to pursue that, trying to research that. Um, and so it kind of just uh, snowballed from there where like I, I applied to live in her house and uh, applied to Yaddo um, and, and just kind of kept trying to figure out ways I could continue the research, uh, find funding for that. And then, you know, at a certain point, I went on the academic job market. Um, I did some interviews, I didn't get any jobs. And I was kind of like, well, maybe I should just move somewhere and write this book. And that's yeah. sort of what I did. Cool. And when it, when it came to this book, did you get, when it was done, was there support from the beginning? Did you really have to fight to find a place for it? Or was, was this, did it resonate with people? Because I mean, it, it resonated with me and I think it resonated with the queer community, but we're not, you know, the mainstream and, mm -hmm. and, you know, Carson is kind of protected, right? Like it seems like through the biographies that they were sort of papering over pieces of her that they didn't want shared. So what was it like trying to get that book, get the book made? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, some of the most difficult parts, I, I had a, a really wonderful experience finding Tin House as a publisher since I'd already worked with them on the magazine uh, before. And I'd also been at the workshop. So I knew some people there and uh, the editor who took the book, Emma was just like, she totally understood what it was I was trying to do with the hybrid genres, which other editors I spoke to were a little bit like, which is it? Is it a memoir or a biography? And I was like, I don't, if you have to ask, I just don't think that this even matters, you know, like yeah, yeah. Emma was really, Emma really understood so early on, which was, and she was such a champion of the book, which became really important um, because the estate, the McCullers estate, um, when I went to them for permissions to use her language, uh, Carson McCullers quotations uh, in the book, they kind of dragged it out for maybe six months of not really responding and wanting to read the book and then finally said, just no, we're, we're not gonna give you permission to quote from her. Um, and that was sort of like this huge blow. The book had already been edited. The book was like going into copy edits at that point. So then it was like me and Emma trying to figure out like, okay, what uh, copyright do they even have jurisdiction over? Cause it was very clearly one of those moments. This happens, I was talking to someone recently who's actually a scholar uh, about like a women writers estates. Uh, and how they try to control their legacies. So like Willa Cather, Virginia Woolf, all these different people, Thanks and Hughes. Um, and basically um, they issue these blanket refusals to writers and scholars, just like, no, you can't use anything. Um, even though they don't have control over everything, they're just trying to scare you into not publishing. And that's, that's what happened with this. Um, but Emma was so determined um, that instead of just being like, let's scrap this book, let's give up on this. She was like, no, we have to figure out a way. Um, and she had me basically take the quotations out that we didn't think, uh, uh, that we thought the estate had control over. Um, and then uh, I had to paraphrase them in my own words. Yeah. So yeah, it was like this whole crazy process. Um, but yeah, that was some of the like early like championing and pushback against the book. Yeah. And have you, have you heard anything from them since it's been published and is now a, a national book award finalist? Like, have they, have they embraced the book or has there just been radio silence about it? 
there's actually a recent development, um, which is that, uh, and I, I don't know if it really reflects on the estate or not, but the Carson McCullers Center who managed part of her estate is going to have me on their podcast, um, which feels like, oh, like maybe they, they're like, okay, we're, we're accepting this now. Um, oh, perfect. Maybe, I don't know. Um, we'll see. We'll see. It could be like I go on this podcast and it's just they're like grilling me. You know? <laughs> Like, gotcha journalism by the like, actually we're <laughs> suing you <laughs> yeah wow <That's> good <laughs> i i really hope that's not what it is i have a feeling it won't be <clears throat> um so in the in the piece that you read to start us off uh, it's a section that i love you say i have read enough biographies to know in no uncertain terms that they are built of artifice and lies and i think as kids we learn biographies are the truth right like it's it's what we write down that happened and there's no gray area and so you mentioned that you read that you've read a lot of biographies so was it during this process that you realized biographies are are bullshit or was it beforehand like biographies have just always been something you like to read um, I definitely read a lot of them when I was young. I think I was really curious <laughs> about like what other people's lives looked like, specifically what like artists' lives and writers' lives looked like in the past. That was super interesting to me. And I talk about reading the Zelda Fitzgerald biography when I was like at a very formative age and just thinking she was so cool. And like, how can I be more like this woman who actually like in the pages of that book is cast as sort of an insane alcoholic, but to me, it was very glamorous. Yeah, right. Um, but you know, it was just kind of like, as I learned more about the, the people whose biographies I'd read, and then especially as I was kind of getting this education uh, in, in grad school in literary criticism, I started to learn that a lot of times the way we reflect back on people's lives um, is, is to sort of tweak them, right? Like, or try to try to understand them on our own terms. And this became especially apparent when I was an intern at the Ransom Center, because so many people kind of would show up there to look at the materials. Mm -hmm. They have their story in mind and they're just sort of like looking for confirmation um, or they're trying to say, you know, they're trying to make a particular claim like, oh, Edgar Allan Poe wrote this story because X happened in his life. But then often they would actually find out that the thing happened after that he wrote the story and then be like, yeah. oh, that's a bummer. So I just think that being sort of on the back end of the research process really helped me um, start to see, yeah, the way this is really a constructed enterprise. Um, and especially in the, in the reading room, I would always see just how personal everyone's research process was, how invested they were emotionally in what they were researching. And I think we all know that when you're emotionally invested, like you're not objective, right? Like you're not, you're not bringing us the scientific truth of someone's life. And then of course, writing about Carson and then writing about myself, I started to realize like, there is no true way to write about a life. There is no true way to um, kind of like capture the accurate experience that someone else had, or even that I had on a day-to-day -day basis. Like that's not possible. We're always retelling the stories of our own lives. We're all always re-narrativizing kind of our own identities as we grow, as we age. So yeah, those are some of the ways I realized that. Cool. And yeah, I mean, you, you're very open about the fact that you've gone into this with an agenda, right? But <laughs> Your, your hypothesis is proven over and over and over again. And, and I think the, the research aspect of this book to me is so impressive because I am not a details person. And so just seeing how meticulous you were um, and just the, the processes you went through was, was eye-opening. Like you really did, did your work and you did your due diligence to show just how gay Carson McCullers was. So hats <laughs> off for that. We can officially claim where you've done the work. <laughs> yes, yes. We've definitely got all the receipts. We've got all the footnotes. We know it. So you are you are just the keeper of the receipts. So I was like, wow. Like the the images of you in like the basement archives. I think it was in New York mm -hmm. when you were looking through stuff. Just that was so that was that was just so visceral. Like you were, I could really see you there combing through everything. Um and I mean, you, you followed in her footsteps all over the country. So if someone can read this book and not agree with you 
they came to it with their own agenda because to me, it's irrefutable at this point. And there are those who do disagree with it and who kind of have their own agendas. There are even like within the, the books and the pop culture that have been made about Carson and her life, yeah. you will find totally conflicting versions uh, of the story. And, you know, that will depend on like how, how much research they did. Like, did they go to Columbus and read these therapy transcripts? That's kind of always my first question. Right, um, right. When someone's like, you know, I have a different version, but it, yeah, it's also what you're coming into it with. Um, I heard from the daughter of um, McCullough's biographer, so Virginia Spencer Carr's daughter, who had always kind of like wondered about this person that her mom was researching when she was a kid. And then she found my book and read it. And she was like, I, you know, this is really not what I thought my mom was researching. Like, <laughs> this is not what I thought uh, Carson McCullough's life was about. Um, but also Virginia Spencer Carr, her mom was a lesbian and was closeted, um, which I found out very late in the process. And Interesting. It's fascinating too, because then she sort of reclosets Carson in that book. Yeah. Layers. Layers. So layers. Um, well, let's just stay on the on the queer track here. Sure. Um, so queer stories are slowly becoming more mainstream. I'd like to think in 50 years, um, your biographer will not <laughs> decide to pretend you weren't gay. Um, <laughs> but there still seems to be only like a certain number of queer stories are allowed out there and a certain um, type of queerness, you know? And, and I wonder now that you've been through the publishing process of such a, a big book, do you, do you think it's changing for the better? Do you think it's still really tough for queer books to, to get made? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't feel like I have any like unique insights into the publishing industry here, but like I do just have like my eyes and what I see. Yeah. Um, and I definitely see more queer books um, and I see more queer books being celebrated, which I love. Um, I would really also love to see, you know, I, I think that um, one thing my research showed me was how many different people in the 20th century we have kind of the wrong idea about. Um, within Main Street culture and within the representations of them that we've seen. And yeah. so I would love to see, you know, more people delving back into some of their stories and their histories, either in, you know, in fiction, in nonfiction, uh, on screen. Like we're able to see like a lot of lesbian stories that are set in the, you know, 17 or period pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the period pieces where they're wearing like the really like mm -hmm. elaborate gowns. Um, and like, that's something that our, our streaming services have become comfortable with. Um, but I, I don't see as much, um, revisiting these women's stories in the 20th century. And I would love to see more of that. Cause I think that these are people that a lot of a lot of us look to as role models or just as people we find interesting and iconic and like the truths of their lives are available. Um, they're just not being like expressed in clear language. And, you know, the second you put some of this on screen, I think uh, it has a really powerful effect. And so I'd love to see more of that. And obviously more queer books too. I mean, I think there's just, there's so much room. There's so many more stories to tell than have been told. So yeah, I hope, I hope there's just more and more. I would, I would love to see that stuff explore because I think the, there's, there's something about being queer where you're constantly looking for representation, right? Like every TV show I watch, I'm like, I bet they're gay. You know, like I just, I'm hoping for it and trying to find it. And in your research, you realize that if, if they were covering over Carson, who else, who else have they sort of erased from that story? So was there, was there a moment when you realized this whole cover-up was, was bigger than just Carson or was it just, you know, finding her, you realized who, who else have we lost? Yeah, I think particularly when I was uh, at Yaddo doing the research that you just mentioned where I was in the basement of the New York Public Library, yeah. going through the microfilm <laughs> and all that. Um, yeah. I, like still continuing this look for proof. At that point, I was like obsessed with the woman who ran Yaddo for many years, um, who I'm pretty sure she was a lesbian. Yeah. Um, but you know, no one, no one says that. And so like, it was like everywhere I turned as I was researching, it, like everyone started to seem like a closeted 
person. Um, and I think many of them were, and I do think it's at a certain point, I do the same thing that you were just saying, where no matter what I'm watching or reading, I'm like, that person's gotta be gay. Like this happens over and over. Like I got obsessed with this, like one sourdough bread making dude when I was in the bread zone who makes the YouTube videos. And I was like, he's, he's clearly gay. And my friends are like, no, he's just British. Like you're not, you're <laughs> picking up on something that's not there. Gay or British, famous game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like, so you start to see it everywhere, but I also think that like the, the flip side, the corollary of that is seeing it nowhere, uh, is seeing it, uh, it is kind of just, you know, the heteronormative society that we live in, um, where everyone is straight until proven guilty. And, uh, when we, when we kind of see the world that way and understand the world that way, yeah, as a queer person, you're spending all of your free time looking for other people like you, other yeah. like models for lives and ways to live. It's probably why I read so many biographies because I was like, huh, they're telling me that I have to like get married and like have a bunch of kids and like just take care of them. And that's what I have to do with my life. Like, is there any other option? <laughs> like, right, it seems fake. <laughs> yeah. around and see if there's any other, other like possibility available. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I think I've lost the train of thought, but yeah. It all sounds great. It all sounds great. <laughs> um, there's another, there's another theme that you, you touch a little more lightly on, but it is another theme that's been getting, um, some long overdue, attention in narratives today and that's chronic illness mm -hmm. um and was this a was this another thing that her biographers tried to cover the fact that she was she was very ill um mm -hmm. and and died very young um i'm just wondering if if this was an area that you did you did more research on and you you learned more about about that part of her life is chronic illness something you want to explore in future work mm -hmm. I learned as much as I could about Carson and her illness. Um, and a lot of the records that were the most helpful were came from Mary Mercer, um, who was really like kind of at her side the last 10 years of her life, going to all the doctor's appointments, surgeries, things like that. Um, and, you know, her story is so familiar, um, especially to like women in the United States, um, because she was misdiagnosed a number of times over the course of her life. Um, and for that reason, they weren't able to kind of catch what had been rheumatic fever and then eventually evolved into a series of strokes. Um, and when she had a stroke, her first stroke, uh, doctors kind of were like, I think it's emotional. I think you're just, you're like really upset or you're really anxious about something. You should rest, you know, you shouldn't be going to New York and going to all these parties. You should really kind of take it easy. Um, and that's something that I think that women experience a lot, um, just the sort of downplaying of their experience when they go to a doctor. Um, and there, there's lots of studies about how women's pain is like discounted and mm -hmm. uh, particularly the pain uh, of women, women of color. Um, yeah. That's something I'm reading about actually recently. But so yeah, I learned as much as I could about Carson's illness and saw in her experience, again, an experience that I'd had with my own chronic illness, being misdiagnosed, the struggle to get a diagnosis, um, mm -hmm. and then the sort of sidelining of it. So Carson's biographers were kind of like, they say she was sick, but she was really just drinking too much. That's sort of the narrative. They always paired the two. They paired the drinking with the illness and sort of blamed mm -hmm. her for it over and over again. Um, I think you see that with a lot of people in the 20th century where like there might have been something else going on and then there was also a lot of drinking happening. And so everything gets a little bit fuzzy um, and biographers get a little bit moralistic about it <laughs> and are kind of just like, well, she must've been an alcoholic and that's all we can really say. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I really kind of like tried to understand her own illness through the experiences that I was having. And, and I've I've written a little bit about that. I wrote an essay called Illness is Metaphor, where I talk a little bit more about my chronic illness and living with it. Um, and it's something that's in the project I'm working on now to a certain extent as well. Cool. Can you tell us more about that project? <laughs> um, that project is a collection of essays um, that are based in New Mexico and they have to do with healing and wellness, um, but also mm -hmm. toxicity and uranium mining. Um, so yeah. Very cool. Yeah, all over the map. 
sounds like another book I'm going to love. <laughs> um, so you, I mean, the, the National Book Award finalist and the Carnegie Medal for Excellence long list, these are huge awards, especially for a first book. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and it might seem to some that you are an overnight success, right? Because they, they don't see that you have these credits back to, you know, 2012 of all of this great stuff you've been writing. But writing one big thing is a huge undertaking. And this was the, this was the first time that you'd really done it? The second time, because right um, before I really um, did the focus, like, writing of the book you know I had been researching it for many years collecting a lot of notes but I finished my dissertation before mm. um kind of embarking on the book and you know if I got anything out of grad school it was the ability to start and finish a long kind of aimless seeming project um yeah and to, you know kind of so it's like I learned how to do that um and then I was I had all this Carson McCullers research so it was kind of easy to recreate and then also very different because I was you know, and this is the, the proof thing we were talking about that I kept coming up against was a hangover from being in scholarly land where you have to footnote every like, you know, thought that you have um, and you have to prove everything to such an extent with things that other people have said. Um, so it was hard for me to break out of that, you know, in my own writing. Yeah. What um, would you say that, that the sort of breaking away from academia was, the biggest lesson you learned in writing your first full length book or is there was there something bigger you learned about writing that you'd be happy to share with us Ooh, that's a really good question yeah, um, you. <laughs> <laughs> i think uh like the biggest thing that i learned from from writing the book is just to follow your nose just to mm. really like like if you have a hunch about something, you know, follow it up. And like you mentioned the book, having something in common with mystery at the beginning. I think my research process is always this like idea that there's a mystery that I'm solving, even, you know, if I've already solved it and I'm kind of just continuing down the road. Um, but yeah, I think follow your nose and, and understand that like, if you have something that you're confused about or you're unsure of, or that makes you uncomfortable in, what you're thinking about or reading about or researching, like that's the place to go. That's the place that has heat. That's the place that's interesting. Um, so even with McCullers, like where I would come up against these roadblocks or these fr frustrations or these kind of denials of her sexuality, things that seemed like they were um, kind of foiling my whole project, you know, to some extent, those were the moments where I really needed to kind of like, uh, lean into that and, and uh, follow that as far as I could, understand what my own discomfort was or what my own frustration was, and then write about that. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's what I learned. I love that. And one of, one of my favorite writing professors who might be in here, hi, Rachel. Um, she gave me the advice similar to that, which is when you feel yourself wanting to get up from the chair, keep your butt in the chair, because that is when you're about to write something that you're really uncomfortable with. And that is where the magic happens. So excellent advice. Yeah. Um, are there, was there, were there any responses to the work that have been personally gratifying to you? Um, besides, you know, obviously the, the big awards, but was there anything that was surprising or really made you made you feel warm in your heart about about this book? Sure, I, I've gotten a number of responses by email and social media. And then also I, I was very lucky in that I got to do a book tour for three weeks back in uh, February of last year, but like right before the shutdown, I like was 13 cities, crazy travel, and then just home for the next year. Um, and people that I met in person who came to the events and then other people who emailed me have shared like really personal stories with me, sometimes so personal that I'm like, whoa, I don't know if I can, you know, hold all this. But a lot of them have to do um, with being closeted and um, maybe even being closeted over much of a life um, mm -hmm. and, you know, reading this book and feeling their experience was validated um, and kind of also being able to see themselves in Carson's story going on and then reading Carson's books if they hadn't already, or even, you know, several people who were like, I loved Carson McCullers when I read her in high school. And then I didn't realize I was gay until I was 40. And now I'm suddenly realizing those two things might be connected, you know, seeing, yeah. oh, I was able to see my own 
experience of loneliness or longing or, you know, just, you know, being different reflected in her fiction, even when she's not specifically writing about um, someone we would recognize uh, as queer. And then, you know, that holding a place, you know, in that person's psyche and that person's heart. Um, those are really meaningful to me and way more meaningful, honestly, than any of the other stuff. Uh, it's weird to be uh, an award finalist in a year like 2020. Like, obviously, I'm so grateful and still can't even really like believe or process that any of that happened. But at the same time, like, it was just like this, it was Zoom and I was just sitting there and like my cat who's on my lap now, oh. my la you know, <laughs> it's just yeah. like, like everything is a screen that I'm, yeah, that I'm, really, yeah. yeah, experiencing. Well, those are all my big questions. I do have three lightning round questions to finish this out. Okay. So I hope, I hope you're ready. Okay. What are you reading right now? Oh, I brought books over because sometimes I forget. So I'm yeah. reading, I'm reading this book. Ooh, this is really good. She's a like feminist um, political philosopher, basically um, talking about entitlement. I'm reading this. Wastelanding. Yes, this is about uranium mining. It's really good. Okay. Um, I'm rereading, uh, in Zanesville by Joanne Beard, um, who, because she has a new book coming out and I just got to interview her and it was really cool. Woo! Awesome. Great. Um, what has been your most clutch pandemic coping mechanism? <gasps> oh, um, I learned how to knit. Um, which, uh, I always made fun of people who knit, like I really did, especially when they like brought their knitting places. I, yeah. I, I mock those people. And now I am one of those people because it is such a like mindless and relaxing thing to do instead of looking at my phone. Yeah. It's a good one. You physically can't look at the phone when you're. No, you're just kind of outside, just doing your thing. <sighs> yeah. Nice. Once a year, I make us just one scarf, just one yeah. long <laughs> rectangle. Oh, I'm just I... making these squares, honestly. Excellent. I, like maybe right. there will be a blanket someday. Right now, they're just squares. <laughs> <laughs> um, final question, very important uh, from the TikTok universe. Side part or middle part? Oh, it just depends on the day. I don't have TikTok, so I don't really understand. <laughs> it's like this huge millennials versus Gen Z Oh, civil war true. happening of they're making fun of so millennials cool. for the side part and millennial oh. and gen z apparently is is pro middle part middle part okay i get it that's so <laughs> interesting i'm gonna think about that <laughs> for a long time now <laughs> okay just looking like a millennial right down the yeah. middle is is not a thing for me um thank you so much jen this has been incredible i feel so honored to get to meet you even just virtually um and i i can't wait to read what's next from you oh thank you so much i think we're thank gonna you. do q and a is that what's happening i think so okay does someone come on to do that or do we read the question <laughs> oh sam hey everybody hi hi sam uh thanks so much that was fantastic there is a, a one uh question here in the q a uh from andrew and uh, says to thank you. first says thanks for your time this evening. Uh, I know my CNF students are enjoying listening to you both. Jen, can you talk about the revision process? Uh, the mm -hmm. fragmented nature of the book suggests you wrote it out of order. What did the early drafts look like? How did the rewriting go? How many drafts? When did the form really take shape? And thanks in advance from a writer and teacher who can't get his students to commit to revision. <laughs> wow. That's a good one. I mean, revision is so important. And <clears throat> I was just talking, I mean, I just mentioned that I talked to Joan Beard recently and she's a nonfiction writer who doesn't revise. And I find that unbelievable. Uh, and like, I'm so confounded by that because my process is like, I feel like my writing process is mostly revision. Um, and uh, so yeah, for this book, um, I, I'm gonna pull the question back up so I don't miss anything. Um, the fragmented nature of the book with the early drafts. The early drafts of the book looked kind of a lot like the final draft, except things were in a different order. Um, and so I had a number of these really short um, pieces, these 
what ultimately became chapters in the book that I'd been writing starting in 2012 when I was working at the archive and kind of continued uh, to accumulate over the process of my research. Everything I was writing was kind of, I, I wanted it to be framed as my interaction with an object with one of Carson's pieces of clothing or her letters or a text or you know a piece of furniture in her house. I wanted there to be that kind of direct physical correspondent. So I was kind of writing these short pieces. I had a bunch of them. I uh, got them all in a Word document, typed them all up from you know the various notebooks and phone notes and wherever the heck they were. Um, and then I printed that out. Um, I physically cut the pieces apart uh, and then arranged them on the floor and then rearranged them. And then my cat rearranged them. And then, <laughs> you know, eventually, you know, got it to a, a place where I wanted it to go. The other thing I will say, and this kind of speaks or goes back to the follow your nose point I was trying to make, which is that I, I had five pieces really early on. And those five pieces, all made it into the book and kind of form a spine of the book. The last chapter was the last of those five pieces and I even like read them in a reading that I gave in Austin. So then everything else was kind of a way to get from one of those little stepping stones to the next. Um, so that's just something to, there's something to be said for whatever your hunch is at the beginning, try to get that down uh, or whatever you think the arc of the thing is, you know, and then you can kind of maybe use that as a guide later. Um, how many drafts? I don't know. Um, and yeah, it really started to take shape once I had uh, all those little pieces in order. All right, next question comes from Zach uh, for you both. Um, what is your favorite story by Carson and why? That's a good one. Um, I There's a number of her short stories that I really love um, and I would recommend just getting the collection The Mortgage Heart. Um, because those are fabulous. Um, but if, if novels are allowed, my favorite novel of Carson's is The Member of the Wedding. Me um, too! Oh, yay! Okay. Yeah, uh, because I wish I'd had it when I was an adolescent. Um, it just speaks to a lot of experiences that I had. And um, it's so, it's short, it's tight. It's like just a beautiful, perfect uh, little artifact, that novel. So that's my favorite. Yeah, same here. It's for me, it's like one raw nerve. It's yes. there's so much longing in that book. And, you know, she she has a lot of queer characters in a lot of her books, but I feel like that one is is pure, feels purely lesbian to me. The way she's yeah. just like, oh, like turning herself <laughs> inside out. And um I recently watched the movie, the adaptation from the 50s. Mm -hmm. And that is also very, very good and feels very queer without meaning to be. So I'm happy for both of those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, from Brandy, uh, it blows my mind that the McCullers estate banned you from using her quotations. How is that possible if you're properly citing the quotations? Um, it's possible because some of the materials I was quoting from aren't published. So they were these therapy transcripts, right, um, that were, they're available in this archive, um, mm -hmm. but that haven't been published, although some have been published in an academic journal. They were letters, um, and, and so they were things that haven't been published, and so the, the copyright uh, goes to the estate, and they, um, again, it's not totally clear what they can control. It's not totally clear, you know, what they could sue me for. Uh, but the fact that they could sue me was significant enough to cut those things <laughs> in that case. This is a related question from Emma. Uh, it says, um, based on my own experiences with archives and museums, I thought there would be so many rules for you to follow when you were in Carson's house. The freedom you seem to have there surprised me. Uh, what were the day-to-day -day aspects about your time there that surprised you the most? The freedom surprised me too because I went to the house after working in an archive where you know I was wearing white cotton gloves to handle any of Carson's belongings and now I was in her childhood home like trying to decide if I should sit on her couch you know and there was just furniture belongings things uh things of hers in the house um and similar to my experience as an intern I think it's possible after I was there and wrote this book there may now be more rules um mm -hmm. 
that also happened when I was an intern where like now there are rules about whether or not you can write about interning at the archive. Um, so that's, that's something that follows in my wake. Um, <laughs> the the day to day aspect that surprised me the most, um, I think was just being surrounded by a particular narrative of Carson's life because it's a museum. So there's, you know, those kind of um, mounted photos on, on the wall with like timelines and captions and things like that. Um, her belongings, some of them are behind glass. Um, and so just understanding that I was kind of living in a narrative that I was also trying to fight against. That was something that I found really surprising and interesting. Um, from Sarah, this is definitely a question for you both. Uh, it's uh, what is your writing process for your current project? Uh, for example, the time of day, analog or digital, uh, research versus writing time. Yeah, um, I'm working on two, two different book projects right now. Um, and I'm also doing publicity stuff like this and I, I uh, have a day job. So there's a lot to juggle. I think that's often true for writers. Um, the biggest thing I've learned recently is to not check my email before noon. Um, that has a huge effect on my ability to do research and to write in the morning. Um, which I've said I've been doing this whole like past year, but really I have only been doing for this past month, if I'm being honest, because it's so easy for the day to get derailed when something comes up. Um, but yeah, so my process looks like I spend uh, the hours until noon reading and uh, researching, typing up quotes, working on essays, uh, or working on the novel that I started <laughs> during the pandemic um, and sort of switching between those two projects. I like to have more than one thing going at a time so that I don't get too kind of bogged down in what I'm working on. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just trying to uh, keep that time as protected as possible. It's very easy for appointments and other things to try to filter in. Or as I was telling Kate, I'm doing some house projects right now. So <laughs> yeah hard for me tomorrow not to want to go into my office that's been like out of commission for three weeks and start painting, but I, I need to not do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working on a novel and um, I also have a day job, a, a literal nine to five. So usually it's the weekends um, if, if possible. Um, if my wife has errands to run, she loves, she loves popping out. So I'll usually take, take the advantage of a couple of hours there, but I really get my best work done when I am completely alone. So for Christmas this year, I asked for a week in a hotel. <laughs> and so I got, I got so much more done that way. And I found that even though I'm a night owl, I am a morning writer, which I have resisted my entire life. So I think Jen, you're, you've got, you've nailed it. If you're not checking your email before noon, because I was like, I was, I was sitting down by nine, just naturally, I would set a timer for two hours and just throw my phone across the room. So I couldn't do it. I think we actually have to physically get away from the device to otherwise yeah. we have all these like weird addiction. Like we can't, it's like, we can't not check it. Um, but that's the other reason why residencies can be really helpful once we're back into a period of yeah. existence when that's possible. I can't recommend them highly enough um, as time to get things done. Yeah, I did Vermont Studio Center too. And I love the fact that their Wi Fi is terrible because yeah, really I got so much done in that studio. Mm -hmm. Uh, a related question from Donna about the writing process. Uh, uh, Jen and Kate, uh, fascinated by your writing process, how lonely were you during that time? And besides Emma, who was helpful and encouraging during your journey? I, yeah, I think the writing process is lonely and maybe your first book process is the loneliest one. I don't know, we'll see. Um, because for most of the time I was laboring in the dark, not knowing if, um, this would ever be a book if I would ever find an agent or a publisher who would ever see the light of day if anyone would ever read it. Um, and so it really had to be more about this mystery that I was trying to solve, the questions that I had um, and what those meant to me. Um, and that's kind of what made it less lonely in a way because you know going back in time and kind of reading these archival materials was a way of, of feeling connected, um, feeling connected to Carson, feeling connected to um, the other people that she surrounded herself with, feeling connected to other queer scholars, other nonfiction writers who were doing things that felt similar to what I wanted to do. 
uh, and all of those connections through reading um, are the things that just in any situation make me feel less lonely. Uh, you know, even in the pandemic makes me feel less lonely. Having my research time in the morning to read and kind of communicate that way and connect that way with writers uh, is, you know, that's the thing that makes me feel less lonely. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's a solitary process, right? But I, I find that when I'm focused on the writing and I find myself talking about it more and reconnecting with the writers that I know. And so places like we were saying, like the residencies, it's, it's validating and it feels less lonely because it's almost more lonely to just be, you know, at your, at your day job where no one, like no one knows what you do or no okay. one cares the way that you care. And then you go to a residency and people are like, oh yeah, I, I quit my job to be here. And I'm just right. going to jump like, like you're crazy, but yeah. you're, you, you value the work and surrounding yourself with, with like-minded people is, is so important. And so even, even though you have to sit down at the desk alone, I, I feel more connected when, when I'm actually actively writing something than when I'm sort of trying to ignore it and just be a human. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Liz. Hi, Liz. Hi, Liz. Hi. Liz is my friend. Um, oh, before, so is that my wife, Liz? Or is, okay, it's your friend. <laughs> this is also, uh, before anything uh, goes further, a couple birthday shout outs in the chat. Um, there is a uh, happy almost birthday to Carson uh, and a uh, happy belated birthday to Jen from the Zoomy. Thank you. And for Mary, I'm guessing your mom, Kay, is going to have my mom. birthday on Sunday. So That's happy right. birthdays all around. All... Happy Thanks, mom. birthday. Yeah, you too. Thanks. And Liz's question. Uh, um, are, uh, Jen, are you aware of any other bios or autobiographies even being written about queer folks who are not out during their lifetimes that directly address their queerness? Um, there's a really great academic book that came out last year called Gay Faulkner. Um, which oh, yeah. I highly recommend because probably we all read Faulkner at some point in our lives in school and probably no one told us that he was gay. <laughs> Just nope. guessing. Um, and I'm trying to think if I know of any other things like kind of specifically along that line right now and nothing else is popping into my head. I wish there was more though. Like I said, I think there's just, it's like such a treasure trove of material. Um, also the second you work in an archive, you start to really, I think, see that more clearly because you have access to all the materials, um, even when they're not things that people have published. Mm. Um, so you're able to see people's personal lives, I think, in, you know, up close a little bit more. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of material there. Sure, well, we have time for just a, a couple more. Um, uh, so one, the first I would like to point to is from uh, a few minutes ago, but it is, uh, what is the most interesting or unusual tidbit that you came across in Carson McCullers archive? Hmm. Interesting or unusual. I mean, there's so many like weird objects uh, that were both at the house and at the Ransom Center that like without understanding why someone donated them or, or why they were part of the archive, like we'll never really understand. There's this little silver llama statue at the Ransom Center. I have no idea what it is, why it was important. Um, the clothes, I eventually kind of understood why these clothes made it into the archive because most of them she was wearing in famous photographs, including the nightgowns, um, which she would often wear underneath like a coat because um, she was bedridden. Um, so, so yeah, those were some of the, it was, it's always the objects to me that really um, stick in my mind uh, and feel the most memorable, the most strange, the most interesting. Uh, yeah. You did a great job writing about objects. I love that part of the book too. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, and to close out, this is from Jessica, and I, it seems like a really a potent note uh, to end on here is, uh, how would how do you think Carson would feel about your book? I, you know, I don't know. Um, I love to think that she would enjoy that she's being talked about um, because, you know, I think she liked the spotlight. I think she liked um, knowing that her work was being read 
and being talked about. Uh, one of my hopes writing the book was that more people would read her um, since it was such a like exciting, informative, you know, experience for me to read her even so late in my own life. Um, not so late, but you know, it, I was in my twenties when I was reading her um, and I felt late to the game, you know? So I, I think that um, in that sense, that I think she'd be uh, excited, you know, to be the topic of conversation. Um, but I have no idea if the version of her life that I'm putting out there is one that she would think is true or accurate or real. I think most of us, when we are written about, don't feel super seen <laughs> or don't feel uh, that what someone else has written necessarily represents us. So, so really, I have no idea. Um, and one of the questions I get the most often uh, is, is like whether or not I encountered her ghost. And mm. the answer is no. <laughs> no, I did not. That's uh, beautiful. Thank you. Um, this is uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, Jen and Kate, thank you so much again uh, for speaking with us and about this uh, this great book and this fantastic subject. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, to all of our uh, attendees tonight, a room of one's own bookstore. Thanks you very so deeply. Um, the book, my autobiography of Carson McCullers, is again available for sale on our website. Um, please take a look over there. Um, this is a, as you probably know, um, a bit unsteady time for independent bookstores in general, uh, but our community has done uh, just an exemplary job of keeping us going and keeping us our lights on. Um, so thanks again uh, from our store to you all. Uh, we really appreciate it. Keep an eye out for more events later in the coming months. Um, thanks to Tin House for putting this all together with us. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, have a great evening, everybody. Um, thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. And get one of these sweatshirts. They're really great. Definitely. And the Do book. Not, and the book. <laughs> and the book, for sure. Um, <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, I'm going to close this out. Um, have a good night, everybody, and uh, stay safe. Thanks. <laughs>